Defense and Chemical Warfare Officer in training. The first uh, six months we spent at Goldsboro, North Carolina, and then we were shipped to Yale University. And to our surprise, we were stationed with Glenn Miller. <laughs> and one hour a week, we, one of the members of the orchestra would teach us the songs of World War I and World War II. And um, he heard me singing and said, uh, Cadet Seidel, you're going to be the song leader for your squadron. <laughs> and so whenever we marched down the streets of New Haven, I would start the singing, and Glenn Miller's orchestra was playing. So I came home and I told my friends, I sang with Glenn Miller. <laughs> I was a captain in the ordnance department and attached to the uh, Air Force uh, for the purpose of uh, picking uh, the right bombs and fuses and the right ammunition when the planes went out uh, and I was in a, with a fighter wing, P-38s. And we, on the 26th of August, 1944, after the invasion, uh, we were uh, in... Uh, about 40 miles south of Paris in central France. Got up early in the morning because I knew the day was off. They had canceled all our mission for that day, all the missions of our flights. And I knew I had a day off. So on that same day in the afternoon, and uh, Charles de Gaulle, the famous uh, Grand Charles, uh, he uh, was going to lead it down the Champs Elysees in Paris. We got the idea that driving up behind them uh, would be a great idea. So I got a, uh, I, I got a command car from the motor pool because I was in charge of that, uh, one of my duties. And I had that pleasure. So we drove up to what we thought was going to be Paris. Uh, as we drove in this, with this command car into the street, we noticed people coming out, and it had a, of course, a flag on the front and a flag on the back, and a star signal, uh, stars on the side, <coughs> indicating Americans, certainly. And we all had American uniforms on. Uh, the people came out in droves and looked, and some of them ran up to the car. Some went back in the house. Some came out later with wine, <coughs> champagne, calvados, all those things came up to the car, and as we drove, I would say 300 people at least came up to the car and shook our hands. They wanted to hug us, they wanted to talk to us, and they wanted to give us something to drink. And I noticed a lot of the wine had mud on the bottles. These people had buried that wine all the time the Germans were there. <laughs> as we got near, near the palace, going up toward the palace area, it was a small hotel on the left-hand side, and a lady came out from that, and she greeted us and hugged us and told us about how wonderful it was that Americans were back. And uh, she invited us into the hotel. It was a small hotel, maybe only 20 rooms. Uh, we went in there, and she said, help me pull this desk out. It was a large roll-top desk that they used to have, uh, remember that sermon. Uh, we pulled it out, and she got from behind there, and she pulled an American flag out that she had back there, and she'd saved since 1938, when they, when they were invaded. And also, she took out a picture of General Pershing. And then I learned that she had General Pershing as a resident in her hotel when he came over to sign the peace treaty in 1918 at the Versailles Treaty. We've all heard a lot about the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and etc. But not too many of you have heard about the Merchant Marines. I happen to be in the armed guards that help to protect the Merchant Marine ships. And the ships that I was on were Liberty ships. Now Liberty ships, not too many people know about Liberty ships. They carried the cargo all over the world. President Roosevelt the war that put up $350 million to build 
2,710 <laughs> ships. Supplies and everything took about 15 tons per soldier a year. And we started down to the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. We were loaded with airplanes on deck and all kinds of food, etc., in the, in the hulls. As we got down to Karachi, or Karachi uh, Pakistan, that's where we took our airplanes off. We just went from there down to Sydney, Australia. Now, Sydney, Australia, we loaded up with a lot of more cargo. And then at the time, they were building for troop ships, for troops to be in number three hole. We had about a thousand Australian troops on board. Borneo. Well, here's where it all hell broke loose. We hit a mine. Had another ship that came alongside of us, gave us power, and then they put a big generator on board. Well, they were towing us from La Guan Island, headed for on up to the Philippines, Manila. Then I got a free trip home on a troop ship, came into San Francisco. Took a train up to Grosseal, Michigan, got discharged. So I made a whole trip around the world. Back <laughs> there <and> money. <laughs> if you are a reader of the Wall Street Journal, you will know that Mr. Laird occasionally will appear in there. He recently wrote an op-ed. Mr. Laird is a big believer that the Secretary of Defense is a position of policy and a decision maker and a leadership. And if you ever have the time, find the book called With Honor, The Story of Melvin Laird. And you'll find in there three great things that Mr. Laird has accomplished in his career. One, he did what no man could do before. He led the talks to end the Vietnam War. After that, he decided another policy should be changed. He thought that our military would be better and stronger if it was made full of volunteers instead of draftees. And he drafted the policy that the President and the Congress approved to end the military draft. <laughs> to this day, our military has never been better because of those policies. Another thing that he did, which I thought was interesting, he told me this story, his, and I'm paraphrasing, so if I have this wrong, Mr. Laird, by all means, correct me, and I think he will. <laughs> One of his concerns with ending the military draft is, how will we get men and women of the medical backfield and health care to take care of our wounded soldiers? So Mr. Laird came up with the new policy, again, another great decision, on how we could, as a country, recruit young men and women and teach them how to become doctors and nurses and such. And to this day, that policy remains in place. With Admiral Bill Halsey and Mark Mitcher. We went everywhere from Luzon to Leyte to Okinawa to Iwo Jima, all through those island areas. And we ended up, and I was there in Tokyo Bay at the peace signing. But it helped me greatly. It helped me in the Congress. It helped me as Secretary of Defense. I learned more in the Navy than I did any other place. It was a matter of human relations, getting along with people, knowing people, and understanding human relations. That was the greatest thing that happened to me as a member of the United States Navy. And I remember one of the first things that I did in the Congress was amend the Pledge of Allegiance to put under God after one day. Mr. Sorry, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Can you tell us your most harrowing experience? That invasion taught me a lesson in life. You never look back. You lift those boys off, I mean, we were all the same age. You drop the ramp, let them run off, pull the boat off from under them, you never look back because it couldn't happen. I mean, life was just expendable out there.
terrific. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I stand before you today extraordinarily humbled by tonight's experience. Oh, 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 o